Okay, we're going to get started. We have a pretty tight, pretty tight uh, schedule for the first session here, titled "Quick Hit." Basically, short presentation topics covering various aspects of uh, radar data assimilation, surface OBS issues, and basically, kind of some overviews. So. Uh, each speaker is given 15 minutes total, so we'll have 10 minutes for the slide presentations and then five minutes for questions and discussions. So to kick us off is going to be Curtis Alexander. Thanks a lot. Um, as uh, you mentioned, I'm going to talk uh, pretty briefly here about uh, uh, radar data assimilation applications, uh, specifically with radar reflectivity data. Uh, we're going to focus on the uh, hourly updating rapid refresh and high resolution rapid refresh. Uh, a little bit of history. Um, the uh, data simulation has been enabled by this uh, NSSL derived uh, national radar mosaic originally in 2007. Uh, we adopted use of that CONUS three dimensional mosaic in 2009 with a ROC implementation, uh, followed by a transition to the RAP in 2012 both of the 13 kilometer scale, and then we transitioned further into the uh, convective allowance uh, regime with the HER in 2013. Uh, if that was operationally implemented uh, later in 2014, and now we're going to be looking ahead uh, to radar radio velocity assimilation, first in the RAP operationally next year, uh, and then in the HER. Uh, but the focus today is going to be on reflectivity data assimilation. So again, a little bit of background, of course, radar observations. Uh, reflectivity is a complicated function of various precipitating hydrometeors. It's not a direct observation of individual hydrometeor types, uh, but is impacted by a, a combination of all of them. In model forecasts, traditionally reflectivity is a diagnosed variable. Uh, it's an estimate uh, from prognostic variables of the individual hydrometeors, uh, which of course are dependent upon the individual microphysics scheme. There's a lot of approaches to assimilating radar reflectivity observations. Uh, you can do them in a variational ensemble way, uh, hybrid combination of those two, uh, relatively uh, early on in the development process for a capability that's uh, fully bringing in precipitating hydrometeors. In that context, uh, non-variational specification of hydrometeors, uh, model forcing function, additive noise, and latent heat nudging are all different approaches. I'm going to focus principally here in the next uh, five to ten minutes on really the uh, model forcing function approach uh, where we specify latent heating from these observations. <clears throat> but we certainly are moving toward more uh, sophisticated methods for the radar assimilation down the road. So a reminder again of how all this interplays in the rapid refresh and the HER. Uh, there are of course hourly cycled systems uh, using GSI for data assimilation uh, where we bring in the hydrometeor observations including those uh, precipitating uh, observations from radar reflectivity. Uh, after other conventional observations are assimilated, and then we apply radar reflectivity as a forcing function again during this filtering process in the 13 kilometer wrap. But then in the HER, we uh, bring in the radar reflectivity observations, again, a similar forcing function in four 15 minute uh, steps uh, for one hour pre forecast before we generate our final analysis with all of the observations and then make a forecast. So I'm going to focus a lot on uh, this uh, latent heating forcing function approach in the HER uh, as well as in the rapid refresh. Uh, the, um, basically, the three steps involved in this process are to pre-process the radar reflectivity observations, again, from this MRMS uh, reflectivity mosaic. Uh, this is a very fast process to interpolate this onto the model analysis grid. We then transform those observations into latent heating rates in the model. Uh, and then once we do that, we apply those heating rates during some portion of model integration whether it be during the forward portion of digital filtering and the rapid refresh or during this pre-forecast hour in the HER. And again, this is all computationally very inexpensive, uh, taking relatively few CPUs and or integration time to execute. Uh, the only equation I'm going to show, I promise, uh, is basically, again, is just a mapping of reflectivity observations into a three-dimensional latent heating array. And this is the model forcing function. Uh, so we're inferring uh, condensation from the presence of reflectivity observations, mapping that into a heating rate. Uh, and we have some variables we can control and tune in this process, one of which is the time scale over which we assume that those condensate formed. And so I'll focus now a little more on you know, how much, how long, and where we're applying these uh, radar reflectivity-derived latent heating rates. So one of the uh, variables in play, of course, is that time scale over which we assumed the uh, condensate formed. And we've varied this over many years during testing. Um, we basically settled on about 10 minutes for the rapid refresh and actually a uh, weaker amount for the HER. 
Uh, there's a lot of impact we get from the 13 kilometer scale of simulation, uh, the reflectivity data on the mesoscale, uh, but then we apply again some uh, forcing in the HER as well. Uh, this is what that forcing function looks like, mapping the reflectivity observations to heating. It's of course uh, exponential as uh, reflectivity increases, reflectivity itself being a logarithmic uh, observation in this space. Uh, so this is an example of what would happen if we doubled that forcing, assuming a time of scale of uh, condensation of five minutes instead of 10. So the next thing to consider is where do we uh, uh, apply this forcing? Uh, we can apply it for regions where observed reflectivity is only above 35 dBZ or 30 dBZ. Uh, 28 is where we pick for our particular threshold at this time. We're focusing principally on um, convective processes and then less on stratiform regions of precipitation. Uh, where uh, larger scale forcing tends to be in play. Uh, so we're, we are targeting more of the convective regime with the higher, uh, lower cutoff threshold for the reflectivity. Um, so again, 28 dBZ is what we're using, uh, that and above. <clears throat> you can also, you know, adjust for uh, other effects such as warm rain processes if you choose to do so, uh, where reflectivities tend to be lower due to smaller drop sizes. Uh, but again, we're sticking with a 28 dBZ threshold for our applications. Uh, how long do we apply it for? Uh, it's about 20 minutes uh, in the rapid refresh and forward model integration during the filtering. Uh, four times over 15 minute periods in the HER for one hour total uh, specification in the HER. So uh, just I want to just bring these all up. The point is uh, with the HER, it's again four 15 minute periods. We're making a snapshot of the radar data at the end of each of these 15 minute periods and projecting that latent heating into the uh, 15 minutes ending at that time. The idea being that the radar reflectivity observations are a trailing indicator of where the heat, heating processes took place. Um, so again, whether there's observed reflectivity greater than 28 dBZ, we're replacing the model microphysics latent heating rate uh, with this specified value. Uh, in regions where uh, the reflectivity is less than zero in coverage, we actually zero out the microphysics heating rate and attempt to suppress any uh, development of uh, precipitation in the model. And in other regions of no radar coverage or low reflectivity, we allow the model microphysics latent heating rate to evolve on its own. We do have a few caveats. We want to make sure that we have a relatively deep layer of reflectivities to avoid tagging bright band as something like convection. Um, we obviously are extrapolating these temperature tendencies below the radar observations down to the model PBL top uh, to avoid truncating the forcing function arbitrarily high from the observations. Um, and then, of course, if it's applied in the rapid refresh with convective parameterization, um, we deactivate the parameterization scheme for the first 30 minutes into the free forecast. If we're attempting to suppress convection, there's no echoes being observed. Here's just the, statistically what this looks like, assimilating radar data into the rapid HER. Uh, with and without that, uh, there's obviously a pretty significant pickup in skill uh, that projects approximately four to six hours into the forecast period. So again, this is a relatively short-term retention of this information, but this is where we want the most impact to be, again, in those first four to six hours after the radar data assimilation. Um, so it's certainly, again, impacting the short-term time scales, and then larger, a larger scale forcing and information dominates uh, on the mesoscale after that. Uh, we've played over time, like I said, with varying strengths of the forcing function. Uh, and basically, you can see here, uh, with increasing heating rates, uh, we do raise our CSI uh, skill, uh, although it does come at a cost of a slightly higher bias. <clears throat> Here's an example of what this looks like, just bringing the radar data into the HER uh, vertical cross-section of convergence through this convection. Uh, you can see, uh, I'll toggle back and forth here, uh, at the starting time with the HER and then one hour into the HER forecast, you can see with radar data without this vertical cross-section shows enhanced convergence at low levels, divergence at upper levels associated with an intense convective process. If we now focus on uh, the application of the radar data in the HER itself, uh, rather than the um, parent model, the RAP, uh, you can see the difference if I toggle over a period of one hour um, without the radar data uh, at right, uh, with at left, you have a better definition already established of the smaller scale convective element. Uh, where the right solution is trying to play catch up over a course of an hour without the benefit of the three kilometer radar data simulation. <clears throat> um, just uh, generally speaking, the three regimes we talk about forecast skill from a uh, forecast, uh, well, when we validate it in terms of radar reflectivity, uh, more skill at short lead times, of course, this is lead time, uh, the vertical axis, time of day on the horizontal, 
higher skills in the red colors, um, and so more skill at short forecast length, more skill also in the early overnight hours where you have greater coverage of convection. Um, so obviously we've got more impact from assimilating observed uh, radar reflectivity of these convective regions. Uh, and of course also more strongly forced environments earlier in the year uh, where the mesoscale environment is probably favorable for development of convection uh, also is a higher skill uh, compared to the warm season. So again, early overnight hours, short lead times, uh, and in the cooler or the more strongly forced season. Uh, we also specify hydrometeors in a non-variational way. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that here. But that does seg uh, let me segue into where we're going, the final few slides of uh, more sophisticated data simulation. But in summary, um, three-dimensional three radar reflectivities are used to specify latent heating rates. Uh, it's a very cheap, uh, quick method. That's a good baseline for our future uh, attempts at uh, increasing the sophistication of radar data simulation. Uh, certainly improves forecast skill, uh, but it can lead to a higher forecast bias in the first few hours. It's mostly effective after convective initiation. Uh, convective suppression is a little bit limited um, in this capability. Uh, obviously, mesoscale forcing will dominate. So uh, in the future, our plan is to basically start moving away from the rapid refresh, initializing the HER, just doing hourly cycling in the HER itself. One hour's forecast feeds into the next one. We may still have this uh, pre-forecast hour as we walk between hour to hour. But eventually, uh, this will get rid of the uh, spin-up and the establishing convection that we have to do in each HER run right now as we initialize from the rapid refresh. This will be a more balanced state transitioning from hour to hour and uh, perhaps produce a more even skill in those short lead times. Um, and then eventually, we're going to bring all the hydrometer information into the same assimilation framework all at the same time. Um, and so it's a more fully cycled system and more sophisticated. Finally, uh, uh, we're going to start working on a storm scale ensemble data simulation set up over a limited domain this year um, and begin to play with, again, some more of these sophisticated ensemble DA approaches, giving us what we think is even more accurate storm scale forecast in the first few hours. And uh, Trevor alluded to this yesterday as well. So, thank you. Okay, we have time for a question or two for Curtis. Uh, Stephen Lord here. Um, I'm really pleased to see you delving into this really excellent data set and getting some information out of it. By the same token, um, is anybody working on a more fundamental approach that would be kind of analogous to the way radiances are done in the GSI? You, know, you have a forward model that's based on model variables, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so this data simulation ensemble here where we're trying to take radar reflectivity observations and assimilate them, projecting the reflectivity observations into a variety of prognostic variables in uh, ensemble common filter uh, method. Uh, we may have a static part to that. We'll have to see how much uh, value that adds, but we are transitioning to a, a more robust radar reflectivity assimilation approach. So we're just using the latent heating approach as a baseline, as a starting point, to see if we can get. Hi, Curtis. So you when you run a uh, digital filter, do you run backward integration? Yes, the, for the rapid refresh, we run the digital filter where we piggyback the latent heating from the radar data on top of the forward branch of that filtering process. Uh, in the HER, we're not going backwards. It's full only forward integration where we're applying the latent heating. There's no digital filtering in the HER itself. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Thank you, Curtis. Thank you. Our next uh, next speaker, uh, surface observation issues, RTMA, URMA, uh, Steve Levine. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm one of the uh, RTMA developers, and uh, I also do some uh, uh, ops processing work and uh, was asked to present about some of the ob issues we see in the, uh, the RTMA this morning. Uh, the RTMA, if you don't know what it is, it's a uh, gridded surface analysis, basically, which starts out with a high-resolution model forecast in the CONUS. It's a blend of the NAM nest and the HER. And we then assimilate basically all the surface observations we can find. You can see all the types there. Uh, they each have their own uh, set of issues. 
Uh, I'm going to focus mostly on mesonet data. There is also the uh, unrestricted mesoscale analysis, IRMA, which runs six hours later uh, to deal with uh, latent data. Uh, this is a, just uh, an overview of how the ops processing uh, system works. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, you can see mostly we get odds. They come into uh, NCO where they're translated into buffer. Uh, one of the uh, potential holdups is that a lot of the uh, native data formats don't contain any geolocation information. That has to come from hard-coded dictionaries, which have to be maintained. Uh, they then go into tanks. Uh, there are different tanks and dumps for different types, and there is some duplication there that we have to deal with. They're then sent into dump files. Uh, and then into prep buffer files, which is the op file that actually gets used in the system, uh, and where, in theory, most of the quality control should take place. Uh, in reality, most of it happens uh, within the GSI. Uh, issues with mesonets, uh, we're dealing with all sorts of types of setups here, from stations set up by universities to average folks setting up stations in their own backyards. And in terms of op weight, we treat them, for the most part, all the same. Maybe that's not the greatest idea, but that's what we're doing now. Um, they are given more weight than, uh, uh, they are given less weight than METAR observations, but they can uh, occasionally overwhelm METAR observations, and I'll give you an example of that. Uh, one issue with, uh, uh, with the mesonet feed is that because it comes from MATIS, uh, MATIS tends to collect as much data as it can find, and there are some stations that report as mesonets that also report as other types, such as METARs and buoys. Uh, there are issues with what's a representative observation for the RTMA, and that's sort of a subjective issue. Uh, from feedback with the WFOs, uh, sometimes they see data that we don't. Sometimes we're looking at data uh, that, they, that they don't. And uh, again, there are sometimes stations where we don't have enough information to use them because we don't know where they are. Uh, quality control in the IRMA right now. Uh, we do uh, honor uh, quality control marks from MATIS. Uh, stations that MATIS rejects also won't be used in the RTMA. Uh, there is a, uh, an SDM uh, reject list that uh, will work for non-mesonet data, and that can be updated quickly, but it requires someone running upstairs to inform the SDM, changing the list, and then eventually taking it off taking a station off the list if the observation has been rehabilitated. Um, within the GSIs where most of the uh, quality control takes place, there's a gross air check that checks it. An observation value against the background that used to throw out uh, more ops than we cared to. Uh, we've done a few things with a terrain check and a buddy check to make sure it doesn't throw out as many. There are uh, provider accept and reject lists and station reject and accept lists that are based for the most part on uh, observation and background statistics. There's a dynamic reject list that's, again, based on observation minus background differences for the past few hours. There's a variational QC that we're putting in with this implementation that goes in in January that's had some mixed results. We also have issue of data falling on the floor for, uh, for whatever reason or observations that a particular WFO might see that we don't see. One issue we have found is that uh, there have been a few cases where folks have asked us uh, why a particular observation is not being drawn to in the RTMA, and occasionally it's because it's an observation we don't get. Uh, it's a station that was set up by someone that, for whatever reason, isn't flowing to MATIS. Uh, the, best, the quickest way around that is to try to get whoever put up that observation to get it to report to CWAP, which is run out of MATIS, and CWAP is the system that works used in the RTMA. Uh, one particular issue with the RTMA that we have to deal with is latent data. Uh, I know a few people in the past few days have asked for a real-time analysis that updates every 15 minutes. Well, that's nice in theory, but uh, in reality, one of the biggest problems we've had with RTMA is dealing with data that don't arrive here in time to be used in the analysis. Uh, the cutoff time is 30 minutes after analysis time, and that's in the middle of a... Uh, of a mesonet, uh, of when the mesonet data is being decoded, and oftentimes that means those data won't be used in the RTMA. They do get used in IRMA, which runs uh, six hours later. Uh, we have a listserv to uh, go over uh, issues that people see uh, with the analysis, and typically a query, it 
someone's asking why the RTMA or IRMA isn't matching the value of a particular observation. Usually it's a METAR site. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it isn't. And there seems to be some frustration on the part of some forecasters that the analysis isn't matching their ops exactly. Uh, we're being compared against uh, match ops all, which seems to have been uh, very popular. Uh, there are usually one of several reasons for this. Uh, Either it's an observation that we didn't get or it didn't get here in time to be used when, with uh, the RTMA. It failed a quality control test, control test for some reason. Uh, it got lost or fell on the floor for some reason. One particular issue that we've seen, particularly with METAR ops, is their influence being uh, overwhelmed, for lack of a better term, by nearby mesonet stations. And you see this a lot in densely populated areas, and I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Uh, one issue we have found is that uh, uh, even ASOS observations aren't perfect. The RTMA assumes all observations have uh, some error, even if it's an ASOS site that the WFO maintains, uh, and that's a message that uh, we've been trying to put through, but there's been some resistance to. Uh, I'll show you an example. Uh, this is uh, an example that we got from WPC, and it shows an RTMA analysis over the summer here in the D.C. area. Uh, the analysis was several degrees cooler than the observation at Reagan National Airport, which is right here. Uh, College Park, for what it's worth, is right up here. Uh, I've circled an area basically along the, uh, along the uh, Potomac River where, the, uh, where they did not like uh, the analysis values. I'll go to the next slide, and the graphic system is a little different here. Every one of those green dots is an observation, and if you look at the circle area going uh, between each slide, you'll notice there are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine observations uh, in, uh, when you look at all the observations that went into the RTMA in that area, whereas in the plot from WPC, I only see, uh, looks like four there, uh, because those observations are part of a, uh, part of a different mesonet P that went in. Uh, this is just a look at uh, the analysis. When uh, it helps, uh, when we get this sort of feedback, we look at the, uh, at the background field, too, to see where things are, uh, are starting out. Again, all the green dots you see are observations that went in. All the red dots are observations that did not get in. These are one-degree uh, gradients. Uh, now let's take a look at the, uh, the increments. These are the, the work the observations are doing uh, to impact the analysis. Basically, this is a measure of the impact of the observations. Uh, these are one-degree gradients. Uh, you can see when, uh, and I'll show you the values of these in a second, there is sort of a washout effect when you have a lot of observations so close to each other along the Potomac River. Right, thank you. Uh, when you look at the, uh, uh, at the actual observation values, you'll notice that the observation at National Airport and the one mesonet site is a few degrees warmer than these, uh, than these other mesonet sites. Uh, these other mesonet sites were part of the, uh, the weather bug observation feed, uh, which is a, a uh, one particular provider that, for whatever reason, was not getting into the uh, uh, to the graphic system that WPC had. Uh, you can see that these odds are a little bit cooler, for the most part, than the uh, than the background values, and that and, and because of that, the back the uh, analysis ended up being a little cooler in the background in this area even though you had one, uh, one observation here, the METAR and this other mesonet, that were a little bit warmer than the background. So this is a case where a lot of closely spaced together mesonets, and because this is from the weather bug, bug feed, I assume that a lot of these stations are from people's homes or backyards or schools or that sort of thing. They're sort of overwhelming the impact of a, uh, of a METAR observation. Uh, one other... Uh, issue that I should point out with the new min-max T analysis, we do have situations where observations will get into uh, one hourly analysis, but not every hourly analysis. When that happens, we can obviously do temperature analyses for the individual for the individual hours in which that observation reports, but we can't do a min or, a min or max temperature analysis for a 12-hour period. Uh, so that ob is then left out of the min or max T analysis. And you end up with a uh, with a situation where uh, this is a graphic of uh, the max T from the URMA minus the maximum of the hourly URMAs in the same area. Uh, this is a situation where uh, the max the uh, 
the max of the hourlies was a good deal warmer than the, uh, the max T value of the IRMA, and that's because we had an observation that didn't report every hour that we couldn't compute the maximum value for. Um, further possibilities for uh, quality control within the RTMA. Uh, there is uh, something Matus is working on called Claris QC that contains a lot of uh, QC regimes developed by NCAR. That will hopefully be going into the Matus feed soon, and hopefully we can use and honor those marks. There are ops processing challenges dealing with duplicate observations, uh, time series quality control, which isn't used in the RTMA just yet. Uh, there is a buddy check that we put in to let in more temperature ops. Perhaps that could be expanded to other variables. There's also a, uh, we've developed over the past few years a database of Mesonet data, Mesonet metadata, in conjunction with the National Mesonet Project, it includes uh, sensor information, location information, stuff like that. When we can get it, uh, and we can combine that with uh, O minus B statistics, possibly to form reject and accept lists. That's being done uh, to some extent right now. Um, one thing I do want to mention is again the listserv we have up here, AOR RTMA. If you have a question, if you have see something in the RTMA and you don't know why it's being, email us. We'll take a look at it and we'll explain what's going on. Uh, other uh, uh, other emails to send if you have uh, if you have questions. We do monitor the uh, the National Blend Z Lab page as well because of the uh, impact of the URMA on the National Blend. Uh, this is just documentation information if you're interested. Uh, I didn't have time to get into a lot of details here, obviously, but these are all links to presentations and other documentation if you're interested. Uh, and that's, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> this is Jeff Craven, Central Reads. Do you mind going back to the table where you have DCA um, now? So I want to make sure I understand. So in this case, ECA had an observed temperature of 72. The background was roughly 70. And in the end, it actually was analyzed cooler than the background because of the influence of all these other odds. Correct. And these are all equally weighted, right? METARs are given a little more weight than uh, mesonet observations, about 20% more. Um, but in this case, because there were so many mesonets so close to DCA, they sort of overwhelmed the impact of uh, DCA. Okay. Um, so one, one thing that I, I'm trying to just think about how our OBS are often used, say, in the evening news. They, t you know, typically you see maps of of ASOS and AWAS, and I mean, have you gotten much feedback from the private sector on these kinds of things? Because again, that would these are at times pretty hard to swallow, and I think you understand why. But and I, yeah, yeah. I do understand the the issue of having all these other OBS in the, in the same grid point. But yeah. I, um, these are tough to digest for for meteorologists. I, I just wonder whether in the weather service. So I just. Yeah. Uh, I have not heard much of any feedback from the RTMA from the private sector. I, I certainly understand the issue. If you have an observation you know, like National Airport that seems not to be being used, and then you have all these stations that could be hit private homes or coming from wherever that are overwhelming the uh, uh, an observation from an airport, particularly one with one like National Airport that's such a major site. Yes, I can understand that frustration. Um, but I haven't, and, and we've seen this occasionally with other airports, particularly ones in densely populated areas. Um, in terms of private sector feedback, we just haven't gotten any. Um, so I can't comment on it. Matt Perutka here from MDL, and thank you very much for this presentation. The 15-minute slot you have here is nowhere near what you deserve. This is much too important for a quick hit. Uh, there's a series called the WCO Science Quarterlies 
that recently got re-energized. I hope I see you and your team there every quarter. Many of the same people here can be there and pay attention to these things because this is our future. This is our proxy for truth. And we really, really, that 20% might need to be 60. And But that's a great conversation for all this group to have over the course of the next couple of years. Okay, well, I think, well, thank you, first of all. And uh, I think another potential issue is, yes, there's an issue of uh, mesonet observations versus airport observations, but some of these mesonet observations we might want to give more weight to. Say, like something set up by uh, the University of Oklahoma, mesonet is one example. Should we be treating those as the same as a backyard weather network? I mean, that's a... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I know there's some other questions out there, but uh, for the sake of time, we're going to move along. Thank you, Steve. Yep. If you have additional questions, you can uh, catch Steve at a break. Next uh, speaker, overview of observational data and inset guidance, John Derber. Okay, I just wanted to make a, a few comments about some of our use of the observations in the analysis system. I, I didn't realize what Steve was talking about, and there might be a little bit of overlap here, but that's probably a good thing. We, we use lots of different types of data within our data simulation system. It's sometimes a little bit difficult, especially for outsiders to know exactly what we're using, especially when it's down to things like um, which satellite radiances we're using, which ones we're not. Um, but just don't have time to go into that too much and try to describe that all. But I did want to address a couple of questions that seem to come up quite a bit, and I know they came up yesterday. The first one is a um, question like, uh, why aren't we using Himawari data, and how do we get this data into our, our data, uh, data simulation system? I want to give you some idea of the extent and effort is needed to do that. And also on the alternate side, how and why is data removed as well? Um, try to give a short answer to these. Um, these are the steps we have to go through in order to incorporate a new data type into our, or new data type or new set of observations into our assimilation system. First one is um, not really something we have to do, but it's something we have to wait for or um, ensure before we can use this data is to assure, be assured that it is a stable data source and that it, it's something that's not changing with time. For example, there are a lot of research satellites that are put out there that the people who put up the satellites want to play around with it for um, the lifetime of the satellite or for or quite a bit of time. And as they're playing around with it, changing calibration, et cetera, maybe they're making it better. I'm not saying they're not but that makes it very difficult to use this data if, if it's evolving with time. Um, also, okay, I just have to go through this quick here. We have to make it available to us in real time in an acceptable format. I know Steve mentioned that. If it's not here in time, uh, and if it's not in a format that we can read, we can't use it. Um, incorporation of the data into the tanks and the dumps. Um, these are not short processes. Because a lot of times you have to write decoders for the data if it's a different format or whatever, or and also get it through the implementation process, and this can take several months there before we even have the data available for us to um, look at. I should also say that in that first step there, oftentimes after they launch a new satellite, for example, they will spend um, a long time um, evaluating the satellite data before they're, they allow it to be distributed to us. I know, for example, with SSMIS data from the DMSP satellite, we couldn't even look at any of the data for at least a year after launch, and people were asking, why aren't we using it? And we weren't even allowed to receive that data by the operators of the satellite. Okay, now getting into more of the analysis steps here. First of all, we have to have the ability to read the data and get the proper information out of the input data um, in the um, GSI or analysis system. That's relatively straightforward. Um, it's uh, on the order of a month or so to get that right. 
Um, but depending on the data type, the next one, the accurate forward model and the appropriate head joint for that um, can take quite a bit of time or it can be very quick. depends on what the data type is. If it's something simple like a temperature observation, that is essentially just a uh, horizontal interpolation to the observation location. It can be done very quickly. But if you're putting in something like radiance observation or radar data or GPS radial occupation data, these forward models can be quite complicated. It can take multiple years to develop um, to make it accurate enough to be able to use this data uh, sufficiently. Once we have this forward model and since we can read that data, we can compare these observations to the, uh, to the, um, to the background values or the values from the model forecast. And that once we've done that, we're able to integrate it into our data monitoring system. First thing we have to do is look at the data, make sure it's uh, reason reasonably good, uh, make sure our forward models are reasonably good. Um, we have to determine whether we need to do bias correction for the data or what, it, what, it, what type of observational errors to assign to these data. So the first step is to monitor those steps of observations that are going on. And of course, we have to do this over a period of time make sure that the instrument is stable, going back to the first one, and also to make sure that um, there aren't unusual situations coming up. Um, this, can be, this can be done usually fairly quickly, but it's always the first step for using a new type of data, a new set of data, is to monitor it and make sure that it's performing as expected. For example, some of the new aircraft data we're having, uh, we're getting, we found that the uh, data has um, Biases dependent on the direction the aircraft is flying um, relative to the actual wind direction. And that's very difficult to account for within the analysis procedure. Okay, once we start monitoring it, we can develop some quality control procedures in order to make sure that we don't get in data that is bad or not just that the data is bad necessarily or that our forward model doesn't work properly for this example would be precipitating clouds um, for radiance data. We, the data has to, um, and we have to be able to simulate that type of observation um, well enough to be able to use that information within our system. Right now, the precipitating clouds, um, our radio transfer models aren't quite good enough, and also the information that we're provided from the forecast model isn't good enough in that we're not provided instantaneous rain rates in the three-dimensional field, so, uh, which is a necessity to properly forward model the data. So we eliminate that data in the quality control procedures. I put conservative there because we always try to be rather conservative in these quality control pe uh, procedures because the, um, you know, a single bad observation can do a lot more damage than having lots of good op observations into our system. So we, we really want to protect ourselves from those few bad observations. Um, once, we, once we have that, we also have to define what type of observational errors we're going to specify for that data and also possibly bias correct that data. For example, with say, satellite radiance data, the biases are larger than the signal, so obviously we need to remove those biases before we can actually use the data. Um, we define the observational errors based on historically how much it is, and of course there is a little. Um, we have an upper bound on it. The upper bound is how well it fits our background field. That has both um, those statistics would have both the observational error in it, the representative error, and also the model error in it. So it's actually an upper bound. Then we have a lower bound is is usually the error that we're quoted from whoever is producing that data, and it falls somewhere in between. And you, Quite often that range isn't very far, so it's not that very large, so that's not very difficult for us to specify reasonable observational errors. Once we've established those procedures for using this data, um, of course we have to test it over an extended period of time to make sure that this data actually either produces a neutral impact, which is the case with most data, or a positive impact. And that's usually, if it's positive, it's a very slight positive impact because our observing system is pretty complete and pretty extensive right now. Um, and lastly, once we have assured ourselves that using this data is a good idea and we want to put it into our simulation systems, we um, 
need to um, put it into a package of changes that is our implementation package going into our um, system here, and that can be a considerable delay. For example, if we were use, able to use MOR irradiances today, which we're really not able to, we still would not be able to put this into an operational imp implementation package um, that would not be before uh, Q1 of SY15, I mean 17. So this is a, um, a part of it is just the procedures that have been established for upgrading our operational systems, which delay the um, incorporation of new data types. Okay. So first part there, I only have a couple minutes yet, so I'll have to uh, whip through this a little quickly here. I think the more interested in putting in data than taking it out. We remove data whenever we think it's not going to be useful for our system anymore, or our monitoring demonstrates that the data has gone bad or something unusual is happening there. We also remove some data uh, in a thinning process because of our operational computational constraints. It also helps reduce correlated errors when the correlated errors in the observation, especially the correlated errors. And also, if there's a lot of redundancy in the data, if we, uh, we've um, observed the Bermuda High 10 million times, it doesn't uh, do any good to be, um, observe it 10 million in one time and add that, add that into the system. This is an example of one of the cases where one of our satellite channels went bad and we were able to remove it. Uh, we removed it very shortly after this. This is another example when the problem first appeared um, where the first vertical line is. This is a uh, second line is where we stopped using it. Um, somewhere in between the second line and the third line is when they told us that the data was bad. And the fourth, fourth, uh, third line is where they um, uh, fixed the instrument. And as you can see, after they fixed the instrument, there's a very large change in biases in the characteristics of that data, even though it may be useful again. So we can't just turn the data right back on if they've actually changed the characteristics of the observations going into our system. Um, removal is much easier than um, um, putting the data in. We have reject lists or blacklists that uh, go into uh, removing some stations when they go bad. Um, we can also make an upgrade that uh, NCO is usually fairly quick to respond to um, in our operational scripts and files. Uh, um, it requires changes to the scripts and the file. Files and as I said, adding this data back in is difficult. One of the reasons why is once the data has gone bad, uh, how do we know? And let's say it suddenly starts getting better again, how do we know it's not going to go bad again uh, the next day for the same reason? Okay, so that's all I have here. I think I'm out of time. Yes, thank you. Thank you, John. We have time for a few questions. Steve Lord, um, can you give a rough idea or rough numbers of the number of people who are implementing things through ob observations and how many groups or different unique types of observations are on the docket? There are lots of different observations. There are not many people doing it. That's, that's rough. That's too rough. Okay. Well, I mean, I, we have about three people doing it in the data simulation group. And as I, you saw on the first slide here, these are very large groups of observations. All the satellite radiances, all the different satellites to put into one category here. Um, but uh, we have all these different observation types going into our, our, our system. So it's, it's a very small number of people. So that's why, and it is absolutely, I think, part of the point you're trying to make. Some, these are, we have to prioritize which data is going to go into our system next and which one gets the resources next. So um, we have to judge as to what, what is the possible impact of that new data. Of course, it's also, um, determine what goes in next by the uh, politics that go on within the Weather Service. For example, if uh, a certain director of the Weather Service thinks that data is important, we have to put that one in higher in our priorities. And it's also determined by which um, 
which groups um, give us resources to actually do the work necessary to put this data in. If you give us a resource, they move up on the priority list um, just because they've given us resources to actually do it. Most of these program, most of these data types um, were given virtually no resources to use data within our simulation system. Okay. Thank you. Um, we know for the GFS evaluations we're having, we're struggling with short waves or any sort of wave moving through the Arctic region, the area north of 75 North. What sort of program analysis do you guys do? I mean, once you generate the first guess, what sort of systematic analysis do you do to identify problem areas and how do you, once you identify a problem area, what do you do to try to fix it? And again, Carbon's not here, but I think he would say this, this, that there's a lot of challenges going on with that Arctic region. Well, that's really off the subject of this uh, presentation, but we evaluate it to the best of our ability for the, uh, with the given resources that we have. Um, we monitor the data, how well it's fitting the data into various locations. We um, have um, plots of our, our average increments over the various parts of the globe. We, we look at that each one of um, cases individually, but obviously um, it's just a resource limited process of evaluating our systems. Um, hi, this is Bill Ward, um, Pacific Region. I guess obviously I'm the one that's kind of been screaming the loudest about all the Himawari stuff, but uh, also I'm just kind of curious as to how this is going to be used. This is actually a complete and total different uh, system or satellite, I guess, other than Mediastat, perhaps, but it's kind of very similar AHI is to what's going to be done with AVI. So are we looking at um, incorporating, as we have with in the past, with empty SAT and, you know, every six hours, or are we actually going to start looking at trying to do this at a much higher frequency now that we've got uh, much more observations given 10 minutes with AHI and five minutes with ABI? Okay. Uh, the... the um it, the data really isn't very different than what we've had so far. The instruments themselves are very similar to what we have on the polar orbiting instrument, the HERS instrument, um, same set, very similar set of channels. Um, uh, we are evolving into our 4D um, hybrid system where we um, takes into account the time evolution of the observations over the assimilation period. But at this time, there's no plans to do analyses more frequently in time. Um, that's just not um, something we can afford and something we can do. Thank you, John. Okay, our next uh, next presentation, AWIPS update. Ed Mandel, is that here? push the buttons or somebody else pushes them for me? Pretty simple. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Ed Mandel. I'm uh, with the uh, Central Processing Software Development Team, the old OS uh, development branch. And uh, I've uh, been managing now the development of AWIPS now for a while. So I'm here representing the AWIPS program today. Wanted to just kind of give you a brief update on AWIPS and then kind of talk to you about, um, I was here two, week, two years ago to talk about data and getting data into the system. And so we'll show you the progress that we've made now in getting that. And there's still some challenges that we still need to address. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. And I'll talk about the release cycle and stuff. So, so um, as everyone should know, we finished the AWIPS migration for the uh, WFOs. Uh, that was in September. We installed the last site. And uh, we're also working with the RFCs to get them off some AWIPS software so we can move those to AWIPS too. So as far as the migration, we're pretty much done with that step of it. Uh, so, so now we're back doing some development uh, stuff. So I have out the release cycle, and I'll just kind of go over 
Oh, there it is right there. Okay, very good. I'll just kind of go over what we have there. So right now, as you can look where we are in the time frame where we've uh, deployed the release 15.1.1 that had a whole bunch of new functionality in there. And uh, there's also a release 15.1.2 that we have at OTME site. And that is the DMA, the broadcast um, um, messaging handling system that replaces the CRS. And that's in OTME. And that ultimately is going to be set into one of the future releases. Uh, for, for deployment to everybody. And then we have uh, the 16.1.1 release, which is what we're working on now. That's a little behind schedule. We're close to we're trying to get that done by December before the moratorium for the holidays. Uh, that also has a lot of uh, new functionality in that also. There's another release after that, the tropical release, which we're putting out to support the tropical program uh, in the February, March time frame. Uh, there's some new changes to how they do the HLS. We worked on that last year, and now we're working a little bit more on refining that this year. Uh, and then uh, the one that we're doing development now and doing some testing on is the uh, 1621 function, and that's more major functionality that we're putting out. Uh, there's going to be one more release after that of major functionality at 1622, which will get out in the summer, uh, July. And then we have a big touch upgrade, which is going to be the re last release of this contract, which uh, upgrades our Java and Eclipse. That's, a, that's its own separate release because there's lots of changes involved with that, especially in going from Eclipse 3 to Eclipse 4. Dot something that we're going to. Uh, we did a lot of um, monkeying around with Eclipse to kind of make it do AWIPS 1 functionality to, as we migrated over to AWIPS 2. And now that we have this new Eclipse version, we have to kind of re-engineer re those or get rid of the, some of those things. So that's going to take some time, and so we've set up a separate release to do that. And so then we get to a point where, if everyone doesn't know, the uh, AWIPS current AWIPS contract uh, comes to an end in the August time frame. Uh, there's a recompete going on now. And um, once that's awarded, there's going to be a transition period there between September and November. So we're not going to have any releases at that time. Now we're going to figure out how those all going to work in the, in the new, new world of the new contract. And then we'll start releases uh, after that. Uh, we'll probably have lots of development pent up Maybe not, even not from uh, the Raytheon folks, but we have other development organizations doing development that we can still continue to do some things and hopefully try to add some data after we come out of the uh, transition period there come in uh, 2017. And then the release process will start after that. Once we have a new, if we have a new contract or whatever the new contract is, we'll, we'll start adjusting things and maybe be doing some things differently or we probably will be doing a lot of things differently in the next contract. So I just want to give everybody an idea kind of release schedule because that's always tied to getting out the new data and, and, and how that fits. So as far as the new data, oh, that's a big one. The, um, we've uh, been, been, been since, since I was here two years ago, we've gone through a whole lot of releases that are listed there. And that's the activation chart. And that's also out in the web. You can look at it. You can Google it and look at it any time and see what the progress is of getting some of these new products out to AWIPS. So on the right-hand side there, you can see the act activation date. There's been a lot of them that have been activated over time now over the last couple of years, as you can see. I won't go through them all unless somebody wants to talk about particular ones. And then you can see down here at the bottom here now we have um, some ones that we're planning here in the December, January, and April time frame. We work with our NSEF, Carissa Flimmer, and Rebecca Cosgrove of our contacts over here, so we coordinate with them to work out and plan all these new data releases that we have. So as you can see, there's some coming out for uh, the Ur there's an Irma upgrade. The National Blend is, is coming out. Uh, we have a HER 15 minutes down in the future, and a couple of other items there as we go down through. Um, so that's kind of the data list of what we've been doing and what we're planning on deploying out. Uh, I presented this last time. This is the process. And uh, there's also a link out at the SREC website that shows you how to submit a new request if you want to add new data. I'm going to plan that out. Um, we're still taking requests, even though we're going to slow down a little bit. We're still gathering requests and, and trying to work on plans and everything for future deployment. And so then, when I was here last time, we had a whole bunch of challenges in, in doing things. There was still, we, still, there was, we were concerned about limited bandwidth and how that was going to work when we were adding all the MRS data and the, and the HER data and everything. So far, that has played out okay, and right now we still, from everything that we're planning on putting on, we have room on the SBN, so that's a good thing. 
Um, there was still there was some concerns about getting the process documented that I had put up there on the on the flow chart and kind of getting that understood with everybody. And I think we've worked through that a lot now. We're still trying to formalize that with the Raytheon folks, but I think we've made some good progress on there, but there's still a little bit of work to be done. Uh, limited resources. There was always a limited resource as far as development. We had all this new data, but we needed resources to help do development to get it into AWIPS. Uh, we've been able to tap a lot of the folks out in the field in the region and stuff, and they've been helping doing development, Eastern Region, Central Region, and others have been doing development to get new data onto the system. And then uh, also we have established an AWIPS, a software development team, separate from the other contract, the Raytheon Chance contract. And we have a group of folks that are helping us do some of the daily type enhancements for AWIPS, and one of the things that we'll have that group focus on is the new data and stuff. So we do have some more resources now that we're trying to put on focus on that so that we can continue to keep up with, with you in introducing new data. And we still have a little more work to do on the visibility. There's the activation spreadsheet, which I had back on there before, which shows what the status of John's uh, can look that up. slide. But, uh, we still need to... Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with me, so out I can skip it. Get that out a little bit more to well, up. I guess it's good to know, but... So that's kind of all I had planned for today. I figured I'd leave enough time for Andy Edmund to ask me questions and stuff. Thank you, Ed. We do have time for several questions. Hey, Ed. Uh, hello. Uh, Dave Novak here. Uh, maybe a mundane question, but can you describe the difference between the DRG process and the FSREC process? DRG is the process that we go through to validate that we can put those things on the SBN and we can go through the talk and all those channels and doing that. So that's the one part of it. And it's the same paperwork and stuff that goes through the RC process and the SREC process to validate those and develop and plan on developing the software. So how do you know if something should go to DRG or SREC? They actually go to both all the time. Well, I mean, if it's data, it goes to the DRG. Everything goes through the SREC. 1045. Yeah, hey, good morning. I'm better looking than Dave. Um, do you want to, you know, one of the big issues around here is how do we get model data up in the field? Do you want to talk a little bit about the data distribution system that's sort of on the threshold of coming out the door? Data delivery? Data delivery, uh, thank you. I, I wish I could talk intelligently about that, Andy. I know that we're, um, we're working on that. I know we're doing some testing out in the regions and maybe even at some sites. I think it's planned for deployment maybe... I don't know, maybe I would think maybe this spring now as far as getting it out more officially to stuff. I have a briefing. I should have brought it along. I can I can pass that out to everybody. I'm not sure it's changed much since I did that a few months ago. If anybody else has any I, any knowledge, they can press it. Sorry. Ed, I'm going to – it's Becky Cosgrove, NCO. I'm going to pile on to Andy. We really need to know what's going on with data delivery. I mean, you know because we meet – all the time, yeah. and we, you and I ask the question, do we put this on the SBN or do we do data delivery? And there's so much I could, there's so much out there on Nomad, you know, there's a, there's a question out there about the ensembles, the global ensembles, and what we send to AWIPS is pitiful, frankly, um, and there's so much more, but if data delivery is within the next six months to a year, I shouldn't add anything to the SBN and just have everybody do it through data delivery, but not knowing is really kind of hampering, I think, our efforts to try to get good stuff into AWIP. So I know you don't know, but if you can kind of press that with Ron, love it. We, we, well, take an action here. We'll set up something. And, I mean, I don't know who the right individual, maybe we can include the same group here. And I, I think we have a briefing that I can quickly update and pass it out to everybody and let them know what the status is. Okay. Thanks. And, have, and we can go to Steve Schatz, who is the, the focal, focal point on that. And, you can ask, answer your specific question. Along that same line, uh, uh, two years ago in the production suite review, uh, we uh, we uh, had Becky and uh, and Lou and a few other people doing some presentations on what we actually can get out of the field, and only what was it two one or two percent of the data that we generate gets out of the field, and so. Um, up to a level, what I see here is uh, doing things the same way, trying to get them better organized, but you don't go from 1% to 50% with just getting better organized. You really need to look at, uh, at where you go with um, uh, better ways of moving data around. And so 
I know we've talked back and forth about nomads. We've talked about open depth threats, that kind of stuff. And just as an example, in 2012, we put in a 10 degree resolution ocean model. We decided to put that out on nomads rather than anywhere else so that our ocean community could look at it. And our ocean community have been looking at that model and full resolution for many years. Uh, so I've heard the plans of building that kind of thing into uh, our uh, data distribution uh, uh, paradigms and into AWIP. So where are we with that? Is there any progress there? Are we going that way? Or is that still just a paper way of talk about it? <laughs> uh, I mean, I... All right, so we, we, I mean, there's a couple of bottlenecks, well, I mean, I, there's lots of data. I mean, I think we, there's, all right, I, we probably made a lot of progress, right? So, but there's lots of things to think about as we're adding all this new data to get from whatever low percentage to 50% or whatever. It, it's how these, four, how forecasters are going to use this data. You know, folks push back to me all the time if I just keep pushing out new data there, but I don't have a con ops on how folks want to use this and stuff like that. So there's a lot of work to be done in that area that to help facilitate that. I know there's difficulty. I know that over here at NCEP it, it, it takes a lot of time, and there's folks to actually get things on the SBN and move those out and stuff. So that takes time, too, and there's some bottlenecks in doing that. So there's the various little bottlenecks along the way that, are, that slow things down a bit. Now, come the new world and the transition over to the new contract, they might, there could be lots of new ideas come about and plans as far as trying to address some of those things and make things more available quicker and easier. So, That's a great segue to my question, Ed. Uh, so uh, with the new AWIPS contract, uh, I believe that we are giving the new contractor an opportunity to help change the architecture on how we deal with lots of aspects of this, including how forecasters in the field access data, which won't necessarily be by the old means of shipping it out to them, but through something like a cloud solution or what are similar. So would you just very briefly let us know, kind of this, let everybody know what the schedule is of where the RECAP is, when you intend to have it on contract, and what options you think uh, the contractor will have the ability to, to provide us and when. Yeah. I, know, I know you're not Ronla, but... I know, and I get nervous when I talk about this because I never know short sure what I can talk about and what I can't talk about, so I'm very hesitant. But yes, I mean, if, if you go out, and anybody can go out and look at the RFP that's out there, I mean, we, provide, we, we ask for the contractor to solve various issues, such as the large hardware footprint, and being able to distribute all the data and being able to get the data out to the folks and making it usable and stuff. And so though, all those are things that we're trying to address, that we want to address from, from the transition and moving on to, to the next contract. But right now, that's not, you know, we're not doing anything in that area now. And data delivery is the only thing that we have that can kind of try to help that. Summer, August. August, and then there's a three-month transition period, and then we come out on the other side, and off we go. Hey, Ed. Um, Steve Weiss from SPC. Clearly, there's a lot of issues in getting the data out to the field offices. We don't have that challenge as much at the NCEP centers because we have better bandwidth. Right. Our challenge at this time is migrating to AWIPS2. We're pretty far behind the power curve. We're struggling, I think, at all the centers. Fran and Joe at OPC have taken the lead to try and move ahead. Uh, I know there's this general sense where we're, I think you said, pretty much finished migrating, and now it's just software releases and update. But the national centers are lagging badly, and we're not hearing a whole lot of so, What's happening there? If you have any comments I, you'd like to offer, that'd be great. I, I didn't. I didn't. I thought somebody else would be briefing the National Center stuff, so I didn't attempt to do that. Uh, I do, and I haven't been quite part of much of that discussion. Although I do coordinate with NSEP and getting Raytheon resources and helping with that, so I know that we have we have multiple folks now at Raytheon helping with DRs and helping doing the migration for NAWIPs. And we also completed a task just recently 
to improve the uh, installation time for installing an AWIPS version. Uh, that, I forget how long it was taking, but now they, we've got it down to under 30 minutes and stuff, which is pretty amazing. And that, that will ultimately benefit the WFOs, too. We'll be able to deploy that to folks, too, and stuff. And, um, and, and, and even that ASDT team that I mentioned, we are helping with DRs and doing the migration and helping Dave Plummer and his folks move that stuff along. So we're, the AWIPS folks are trying to help wherever we can and provide our expertise to help do that migration and move that along faster. Hey, Ed, Fran Acorn, OPC. Um, thanks for your help. You actually have been fixing tickets and making a difference. I think looking at this slide that you had here, I had a moment of panic because I knew in my head that the recompete was going to have an effect on bills. But now I am not entirely sure that we're going to have everything we need for a March code drop. And I don't. I, I'm really questioning whether we're going to be able to go live a year from now if the next build wouldn't be until the following summer. And I see again, now, I'll, I'm, I'm, I, the one thing I forgot to put here is that this is Ed Guest. You know, I don't know exactly what's going to happen on there and how quickly we'll be able to do things. And, 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 and you're right, but I, we do need to coordinate with you guys, your whole deployment stuff. And now we're getting to the end there. How do we work? your deployments and your end releases and stuff and fit it into this too. Well, and that's the other question is, are, do you anticipate there's going to be bug fix releases in between that? I or is this just I would hope major so. release? I would hope in this area here we still can do bug fixes. Right. Okay, we need to, uh, we need to move along. Is that the contractor is supposed to be able to take over the responsibility fully and stuff. So. Let, let me just finish with one, one statement. Okay. So there is a meeting this afternoon. It's a manager's meeting at 2 o'clock, basically, on uh, uh, the status of where the OPC, where the migration is, is actually, uh, and the other projects that, it's, that are going on. It's in room 1655 at 2 p.m., and there's plenty of room in that room. Well, thank you, Ed. Your next, uh, next speaker, Brad Farrier, overview of microphysics and inset guidance. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to give, a, as, as it was said, I'm going to give an overview, and I want to thank Eric Legal for his help and for several slides that I'll include here. Um, if anything, this is the crib sheet for microphysics, um, and I thought I would just try and condense it in one slide. Uh, on the top row is the GFS and GEFS. They're running the Zhao Murthy microphysics, which calculates the water vapor. Um, can calculate the specific humidity action in the model. And let's see, where is the... Oh. Is there a laser pointer here? Ah, oh, okay, thank you. Um, and a total cloud uh, array, which is used, an ice water flag array is then used to break that down within the, within the individual physics in terms of cloud water and cloud ice. So I'm going to distinguish between these different schemes what's infected in the model and then what's treated within the microphysics. For the NAM parent, which and the NEST, they're running both Ferrier and Lego, Ferrier Lego um, in the NEST. We're not calling convection. I'm not talking about convection today, but that is important in terms of the performance of the microphysics and the overall model. But then the parent, it's something similar where there's specific humidity and total condensate. But then there are these um, storage arrays, uh, which are explained down below here. These are 3D storage arrays that allow us to, within the microphysics and the radiation, to break down the total condensate into cloud water, rain, and ice. And then within the microphysics, it further breaks it down into the cloud ice, and the snow plus grapple. And then there's an additional array called the Rhine factor, which I will describe in the next slide, which is used to basically describe the ice density and the difference between, and, and the spectrum between snow, which is unrhymed, and, and sleet, which is like ice pellets. 
something similar is run in the H wharf, but it's very similar to the NAMP parent where it's just the total condensate that gets affected. And then the high res window, an earlier version of the Ferrier legal microphysics, which is similar to what's being run which, uh, in the wharf code, uh, which is a earlier version of the microphysics. In the high res window, it's a, also a similar setup where the uh, vapor and total condensate are evicted, and then within the, the physics, the individual species are separated out. <clears throat> In the ARW, a modified version of the WSM6 scheme is used, and Jeff Domingo talked about that on Monday, um, which reduces the grapple production, which led to improved reflect composite reflectivity and equitop heights, which was important for AWC. And then in the wrapper, Thompson has run, which includes um, water vapor, cloud water, the various size species, QG is grapple, and then the number of concentrations of the ice and rain, and then also within the, the physics itself, so they're fully consistent. There's no shortcuts employed. Within the Shref, if you click, this is a link that describes in gory detail what's done in the ARW and the NMMB. There's a mixture of analyses, physics, and um, the uh, boundary conditions. Quite complex. But in terms of the microphysics, it's a mix of the Ferrier Ligo and WSM6 in the NMMB members. We tried to get Thompson to work, but we had uh, failures which we think was due to a lack of proper coupling in the cumulus parameterization as it dealt with the number of concentrations of ice and rain. This is based upon discussions we've had with Israel about it. Um, they found the source of the error. And then um, in the ARW, it's Thompson W6 and, and the older version of, of Farrier. So these are all mixed together in the Shreff. Here's a um, summary of the Ryan factor. It's really, think of it as a variable ice density. It's the ratio of the growth by vapor deposition plus liquid accretion in the numerator, and then the growth of ice by deposition in the denominator. And as if the ice grows purely by vapor deposition, think of the ice crystal, this sort of cartoon ice crystal here as growing in size. So if you want to think of it like a sponge, the sponge gets bigger and bigger and bigger due to vapor deposition. If there's liquid accretion, which means um, collection by cloud water, by the ice, or the freezing of super cold raindrops, that's assumed to fill the ice lattice. And that's shown very simply here as this blue circle filling in the air within the ice crystal. In reality, if I was good with graphics, I would have it coat the entire ice crystal. But I'm not a graphics artist, so simple cartoon here. And as this right factor increases, the um, density of the particle increases because you're filling in the air holes with ice. And uh, WPC has employed some aspects of this to convert these in terms of what's happening at the surface in terms of snow to liquid ratios. So these are the lowest snow to liquid ratios. These would be fluffy snow associated with high snow to liquid ratios. I, uh, you, many of you may have seen this before, but it's just a, a, a nice, I think, and, and many thanks to SPC for working with us in evaluating the impact of the scheme um, for severe weather and their impact on their operations. Um, on the left is the older version of the microphysics before the last NAM implementation in August of 2014. And so the top row is the vertical cross sections. The bottom row is the composite reflectivity showing the location of the cross section. Uh, in the middle row is the changes that we made to try and 
improve the vertical structure of the convection and the overall reflectivity structure of the storm. And on the right is the observed reflectivity. Now, these coordinate, vertical coordinate systems are very different. So this is in terms of, uh, so you can't match them one on one. But overall, we're trying to, we're, we've improved the overall storm structure as a result of these changes. This I wanted to show because to, to tell two stories. One is um, the overall how complex things can be. Uh, this is from the fire weather nest for a case right around the time before the New York City blizzard, or the, bus, the blizzard bus, where it actually occurred over, uh, the worst of the storm was over um, further east over uh, New England. This is composite reflectivity. The cross section is depicted here, so south and north. You see the zero C contour here. Leeson, and it may be difficult to see, but to there are contours, and ignore right now the aviation based plots. And then right here is, you can see some hints of rain due to melting ice. The light blue shows areas of cloud water greater than 0.1 gram per kilogram. And then these red blotches here are the snow plus gravel. The various stipples show the density of the, of the snow. So this is sort of light to moderate rhyming, whereas in here with heavy stippling, this is sleet. So we, we simulate all this structure, but it's difficult to get all that information to you. It's also to show that these are relatively low and warm cloud tops. Now, it's challenging because the overall performance is driven by other parts of the model and the model physics. That's, and you, many of you have seen this wheel of pain before. Um, but it's the drive home the fact that putting all the resources just within red scale microphysics, it has to be tuned properly and working interact properly with the radiation and whether you're running a convective scheme or not determine, can determine um, optimal design. Additional challenges with the microphysics are that we don't know very well what the ice nucleation and multiplication processes are, the various particle habits, especially at minus 40 or, or colder, there's lots of variations in nucleation rates. Um, collision and breakup between ice particles, That'll limit how much you can really fully simulate in turn without large uncertainties the number concentrations, even though we should still go down that road. Um, the properties of the rhyme in mixed habit ice particles. And especially when all this occurs in deep convection, there's a lot of variation between the different schemes. So assessing cost benefits of more advanced schemes is challenging and should be based upon evidence rather than just on conventional wisdom. Um, one of the things that we are trying to do more is build up an effective series of graphical analysis tools to interrogate the microphysics in, in, in a variety of different schemes. And we're using more of the remote sensing observations. We want to exploit more in the future passive and active microwave, but we don't have enough people, as John said, to really do that. And uh, we have ongoing projects with uh, DTC and ESROL, and we want to make use of some more cloud information in the IRMA and RTMA. Um, we've had interactions with the different service centers. That's been very helpful. And in my last slide, I just want to say that this, this is really like a giant puzzle where we're trying to go from individual pieces which try to fill in a complex puzzle based upon different because these interactions are so complex, and it's, we don't really directly observe a lot of the important things that drive the descriptive properties of the ice and performance of the, of the microphysics itself, it's part of an integrated system. We need to try to think in, in a in more integrated manner. And just improving processes won't be of interest to the forecast if it doesn't lead to improved forecasts. And, uh, and please mute your phone. That we face with Thank you. computing and bandwidth and having a pretty complex production system. So that's it. Thank you, Brad. 
We have time for a few questions. We have a question for Brad. They were all asleep. <laughs> no, I mean, you and I have had this discussion a lot. This physics wheel of pain is quite uh, quite important to address. So, uh, yeah, improve processes, improve one, improve another, improve another, improve another, um, and make sure our pieces aren't flipped upside down for some reason. Um, that's <laughs> right. Get them to fit. So I, I guess um, it, it just brings uh, together this whole pre-testing environment that we that we put things in before we get them into the full forecast, um, you know, to make something that's actually useful as an end product for, for the forecasters of field or so on. So I just want to say there's, there's a lot of steps that we're trying to improve to make connecting the puzzle pieces um, a little more interesting, or I mean a little more effective rather than just from the puzzle analogy, take one, try it with another, and just randomly do that, trying to do it real effective. So um, I, like the, I like that. I like that analogy. Thank you. I've got the land, so it's an edge piece, so it's easier. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask myself a question and answer if it's okay. And it's based upon experience from last week's um, workshop. And that was that when I, I came in late during the working group discussion, and they, they basically, people who do the remote sensing were saying, no matter what scheme we run, we don't get consistent radiometric signatures from uh, the vis IR to the microwave and to the radar. And it just, I think, goes to show that this is really kind of a puzzle that we're trying to solve. So how do we, the next discussion will be on requirements. And so I could imagine a case where, let's say, the requirement is to improve a certain element to the boundary layer or temperature. So, and we all want to do it physically based. But what, you know, as you just said, in you know, the physics wheel of pain, it, we're not there. So how does, I'm trying to connect, which, you know, you might make some changes in the microphysics to address a requirement, but it's not right. <laughs> and, and so I, I'm just, is this some, how does EMC address this? Where, or are, you know, as we think about these requirements, the requirement is improved performance, but you are doing perhaps shortcuts or other aspects to get to that requirement, but it might break and make something else worse. Maybe, maybe that's my point. If, if you're going to prioritize requirements in the physics wheel of pain, you might break other things in order to meet that requirement. Um, I don't think we do that. Um, if that's your perception, then we need to talk more. Um, what I've been working on since early October has been pretty much nothing to do with microphysics. It has been to do with the overall model performance associated with, if it's okay to, with Jeff, um, NAMNEST failures associated with Joaquin. And we, we now, I think, have identified an area where we need to focus more attention on, and it has to do with um, the PBL, but it's not in the classic PBL sense. It's how does the PBL behave above the, the, P, the, the, the connection to PBL with the atmosphere in the, free, in the free atmosphere? And there's different closures that, that, that impact how um, the temperature and moisture evolve. So one closure might never produce malls, Another might produce malls all over the place. And from a microphysics standpoint, that's very problematic because one scenario could feed water vapor to the scheme very slowly. Another one could be a fire hose of water vapor to the scheme. The first scenario will lead to low precip because there's, no in there's a lack of input. The second leads to high to heavy rainfall. That's why it's an integrated problem. And we will get there, but I think it is an evolving process and what involves solving a integrated problem. Did I answer your question, Dave? I still think in the meantime there are trade-offs and there will be some things that are degraded to make something else better. Um, and that's because of other aspects in right. the physics that are at work here. Right, so this is the whole, yeah, I'm not just talking about microphones, I'm talking about, you know, the whole, there are trade-offs. 
So it, I think it, oh, there are trade-offs, and in fact, uh, in some ways, the organization it helps prioritizing what are the highest things that we need to focus because we're not going to be able to do it all now. Okay, we've got time for one more comment. Well, Dave, you're completely right. But if you go back to uh, to don't have to go. Just think about the slides. Um, limits in available computing. Manpower. Uh, look at the complexity of what we what we're trying to do. Look at all the different schemes you're working with. Um, if if we can come like with like what both uh, Stan and I said yesterday, if we can come to a scale aware package that has stochasticity in it to uh, to get uh, diversity, um, that will help us using our resources. Uh, yeah, we'll still do a heck of a lot of different uh, experiments and we'll need a lot of computer resources, but we'll have a, a, a much better way of using our human resources. And, and I think you hit a point. At some points, every now and then, it is worthwhile to take a short-term hit for a long-term improvement, and this may be one of those places. Okay, thank you, Brad. Next speaker. It'll be Steve Weiss of the SPC talking about high, re high resolution guidance verification. All right, thanks, Greg. Um, this is a, a team effort work uh, among, uh, among folks at SPC as well as obviously outside of SPC, um, NSSL, even the Met Office folks who've provided some of the ideas for this. Uh, for those of you who were at the Warner and Forecast Ensemble Design Workshop in Boulder in late July, you've seen these slides before. We've uh, pulled them out of the hat uh, to show for this short uh, presentation this morning. And I certainly want to thank the other folks uh, listed, among others, for their work on, on this. So we began looking at objective verification more in depth about three years ago, over three years ago at the uh, 2012 HWT, and particularly related to simulated reflectivity forecasts from convection allowing models. This is a first step in terms of trying to do a, uh, provide more useful information in the objective part of the verification. Clearly, for our purposes with severe weather forecasting in particular, the reflectivity by itself is not sufficient, but it's the starting point. If you don't get the storms in approximately the right place, then other aspects regarding convective mode, intensity, evolution, et cetera, uh, may not be as useful. So what we, we had a specific uh, section of the experiment to compare uh, the, the standard or traditional subjective evaluation from the uh, participating teams each week in terms of how good is this forecast from different models? Uh, how are you evaluating uh, aspects of false alarm, uh, timing, et cetera? And we did comparisons of the subjective evaluation to several objective metrics that employed both grid-to-grid -grid comparison as well as spatial neighborhood. And if you think about it, uh, the traditional methods of grid-to-grid of grid, uh, may not apply particularly well when you get to very high resolution because there's relatively low predictability of getting the storm at the exact grid point. That eventually the radar might show something. So we started to examine spatial neighborhood approaches, and when we compared these approaches to the grid-to-grid -grid verification, the participants overwhelmingly said, this agrees a lot more with my perception of what's a useful forecast. So we've developed an in-house framework to examine objective neighborhood statistics, uh, to see how models are performing, and also for help in evaluating the parallel models that EMC and GSD produce. So to give you an idea of the neighborhood approach, here's just one example in the upper left. You're looking at a simulated reflectivity from the missile war from back in 2013. On the right, uh, that was at the time was called the NMQ from NSSL. It's now the MRMS radar. And you'll see that there's some correspondence between them. But if you go down to the grid points on a four-kilometer grid, 
you'll find out that among the many, many thousands of grid points across that particular domain in the upper right, there's only a one-to-one -one match at 32 grid points, which would say this is a pretty lousy forecast if you apply standard metrics in a grid-to-grid -grid comparison. However, if you find the neighborhood max reflectivity both in the observations and in the forecast, you get something that looks like this, and it's going to blow everything up. Um, a certain radius of influence. And it'll look like this. And when you compare these two, then you start to see on a larger scale, particularly uh, that's useful for SPC forecasters in the 12 to 36 hour day one outlook, you get a lot more correspondence between forecast and observations. And in fact, you get over 11,000 hits if you apply this neighborhood approach uh, using a 40 kilometer radius of influence. So basically what it comes down to is it's similar to horseshoes that we think in convective scale forecasting close counts as well as being right at the grid point where it actually occurs. So what we have done is taken the neighborhood approach and applied it to both traditional metrics using a two by two contingency table. So we can compute POD, FAR, by, uh, frequency bias, CSI, et cetera but then go a little bit farther and by applying a smoother to both the model and the observations, we can get probabilistic observation fields. You can see that uh, on both the left and the right. Uh, by taking this approach, you can turn the observations into a probabilistic field as well as a probabilistic field from deterministic models, and as you'll see a little bit later, applying this to convection allowing ensembles as well. We also found that the fraction skill score, which is a variance of the Breyer score, but applied in somewhat of a different way, can also be calculated. This has been uh, promoted first by folks at the Met Office, and then other folks at NSSL and elsewhere um, have been using this uh, to, uh, to benefit the, the uh, objective uh, calculations and interpretation. So, We've applied this to uh, a number of the convection allowing models that you see in this particular performance diagram. This is something that Paul Rober developed so that you can combine POD, FAR, frequency bias, and CSI into one diagram and see how they are interrelated. This is for period from April through mid-July, but the later statistics for this year haven't really changed the uh, the performance that much is this covers a lot of the peak convective season. And you can see uh, how the different models compare, whether they be the NSSL in blue, which has a higher POD, a higher CSI, but also a higher um, bias by, by far in this case. Uh, the EMC models in terms of the NAM nest and the high-res windows have somewhat similar performance characteristics. And if we look at the fraction skill scores, which are not shown on here, but we put on the diagram, you gain a sense of how well they are doing using the neighborhood approach. And we find this to be uh, particularly useful in giving a more realistic representation. So what happens when we go to ensembles? Let me give you a, a sense up here in the upper left. This is the uh, SSEO 24-hour uh, forecast of updraft helicity max uh, from any member uh, across this, or uh, broken down by members. And you can see on the grid point by grid point basis, it covers fairly small areas. If you go ahead and imply a neighborhood uh, radius of influence of 40 kilometers, and then compute the, pro uh, the, the uh, fraction or essentially the coverage across the area, you get a noisy field, but a more continuous field to some extent and then you use a Gaussian smoother, and you actually wind up getting something fairly useful in terms of the ensemble fort forecast. Pardon me. So uh, we can apply this again both to deterministic TAMs as well as ensembles. This gives you an idea of uh, a case from the spring experiment where you can see here uh, probability of a reflectivity forecast. Sorry, pointing at the wrong thing. And then this is the uh, observed radar in a probabilistic sense, where you can then do comparisons with the fraction skill score. And in fact, this is hourly comparisons during 
uh, last spring's experiment of fraction skill scores for five different uh, convectional allowing ensembles. We can see the hourly uh, trends uh, from 13Z out to 30Z, uh, 30 hours at night uh, in the forecast, and then do some comparisons in an overall accumulated sense uh, for the different ensembles. So we find this to be a, a useful approach. This is not uh, the end all, of course. It's only affecting aspects and exploring aspects of simulated reflectivity. Um, at this particular point, there's clearly uh, newer or other approaches that can supplement this, particularly object-oriented approaches. But we wanted to give you just a brief idea of some of the neighborhood applications that we've been applying to, to get a better handle on objective uh, measures for performance. And that's it. Thank you, Steve. We do have some time for questions. Hey, Steve. Uh, interesting work. Um, how did you determine your radius of influence and the characteristics of your filtering, and how sensitive is, are your results to those values? There is going to be some sensitivity, but um, not as much as you might have imagined. Um, there was some initial testing way back when in the late 90s, early 2000s in terms of what we call the practically perfect forecast where the, the 40 within a 40 kilometer radius is approximately 25 miles of the size of a metropolitan area. Um, but we also, which is, is what our probability forecasts are at SPC, there's been other work done in terms of the sensitivity of the neighborhood approach. Uh, there was a master's student that worked with us uh, five or six years ago now, Amy is up at AWC, that examined different uh, uh, radius of influences and, and we're, they're actually doing more work now in, the, in an OAR HWT uh, project on appropriate radius of influence. And what we're finding out uh, looking at that is approximately 40, 50 kilometer radius seems to provide useful information on the scales we're looking for in terms of outlook type forecasts. So uh, some statistical comparisons and again, some subjective as well. Hi, this is a comment from the field uh, from Steve Zubrick at Sterling. Nice presentation, Steve Weiss. Uh, for an old guy, you do pretty well. Um, for the nearest neighbor or, or you know, for the, the, these radius that you use, you know, uh, we just found out that with visibility and with, the, you know, with low conditions, with fog, that it's probably not a good idea to use, you know, something like a 25, you know, mile radius or anything like that. Uh, and, in, and in fact, in the NCAR model uh, that they run for the website, they, they actually just turned that off. Uh, today and implement it just the full resolution of the of the visibilities. So, so certainly with radar it makes sense. But there's some things you know where the valleys don't move with time that uh, having in a field like visibility where fog collects in valleys it's probably not a bad idea to have it. Uh, you know without that. Yeah, Steve, I think you're absolutely right. Right, there's going to be some event dependence on how you're going to want to uh, verify certain phenomena that the higher resolution models um, can produce, and, and we certainly have to be cognizant of that. So it's a good point to bring up. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Tim Schneider from Ezreal. I guess close is like beauty, right? It's in the eye of, be of the beholder. And I think um, one of my questions was basically, how did you arrive at the 40 kilometer? And that was already asked, but I, I can't help but trying to connect what Trevor presented yesterday, I think it was yesterday, about you know, the ensembling approach and, and sort of his radius of influence with yours. And I'm wondering, maybe this is too open-ended of a question, but I'm wondering if there's some kind of connection between what Trevor's been working on and what you guys are finding in this near, nearest neighbor, not nearest neighbor, but the neighborhood approach. Oh, definitely. Um, I know Trevor has said he's already been talking with folks at SPC and our uh, development branch to exchange ideas on this. 
Um, this is, again, what I, I tried to say, this is a start to try and uh, come up with improved verification statistics for high-resolution models. Our focus has been on convective storms, and uh, clearly a community dialogue is going to continue on the better ways to do this. I just wanted to make a comment. We embrace and like that technique and have it built into our real-time database, and we routinely, for all, for 5 dBZ threshold intervals, or, um, we upscale to from 3 to 13 to 20 to 40 to 80 and have all those available that we can just click on. And we do see different things, Paul. There's kind of a cascade from higher threshold values to lower. But the real proof for us is, you know, you say, well, that you're upscaling. You won't see the small scale stuff. But in fact, we made a plot of the diurnal cycle of the same fields verified at the different um, wavelengths or, or, or scales. And the CI especially comes out because this, I think I'm saying what everybody knows. This right at CI time, the convection is really small, so you'll get the false alarm right next to the miss. But then as you upscale, so in fact, going to the upscale pulls out accuracy of small scale features. So we think it's a great technique. No, I think what we have we've certainly thought about this in various ways. If you're an emergency manager in a particular county, a 40 kilometer radius may be too big for you. You may say, I only care if it's within a county of me or in my county, and I want to know grid point to grid point how accurate it is. Um, the skill isn't going to be there uh, very much, and I think we all know it in terms of when and where is the first thunderstorm going to develop, and can we even uh, confidently try and uh, indicate that. But so depending on your needs, it's liable to vary. We can look at different uh, ROI, see what the effect is. We have found for the purposes of SPC type forecasting that this works pretty well, but there's certainly room for, for variation. Time for one more question. Uh, Steve, I have a question. Uh, I saw you using hybrid scan reflectivity, and uh, even we using hybrid scan reflectivity for the corners domain, we still do not get the full coverage of uh, all the corners. Do you consider this a factor when you compare these uh, scores? We haven't necessarily done that. Most of the severe weather focus is in the east of the Rockies, which tends to have better radar coverage. So again, for this particular approach, we have depended on that primarily at this point. Um, in other areas of the country, Certainly, that may not work out as well because uh, you're going to have beam blockage in parts of the West, uh, uh, lesser coverage in some areas, even when it's in the, the so-called flatlands, um, where there's a part of southeast Montana that doesn't have particularly good coverage. So uh, these are things that we have to consider as we, as we go deeper into this. Thank you, Steve. Final presentation in the session. Jeff Manikin, overview of precipitation type output. The, uh, the purpose of this session was to cover various elements of the production suite uh, from beginning to end. And uh, I want to thank uh, Jeff Demego for the uh, uh, idea for this session and then the uh, other speakers for uh, presenting some, some really uh, great material uh, this morning. Uh, we've, we've covered the elements uh, from data assimilation to the forecast to uh, display uh, and verification, and I'm going to finish with a, a post-processing uh, 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 issue that uh, we always get a ton of questions about uh, every winter, and that's uh, how we generate uh, precipitation type as a, as a post-processed field. And uh, I'm going to talk about where we are and where we're going, but first going to give a quick little bit of history. And if you go back to 2005, the, uh, the single, we used a single algorithm, uh, in, and we go back to the ADA model uh, days. And it was the, uh, uh, what's known as the Baldwin and Contorno uh, algorithm, uh, also known as the NSEP uh, algorithm, uh, a basic uh, decision tree uh, type uh, algorithm. And uh, the, the, the thing that, that caught my attention that uh, led me to do some further work on this was we saw a lot of events like this, where this is a, a forecast sounding, in this case, for Philadelphia, uh, clearly uh, below zero uh, throughout the uh, entire column. And the uh, Baldwin-Contorno algorithm predicts freezing rain 
uh, out of this. And the reason is there's area checks that uh, you integrate kind of the warm and cold uh, areas uh, in over the saturated uh, depth. And the area check uh, that's critical here is actually based not on a temperature of zero, but on a temperature of minus four. The idea was uh, that they wanted a, a very high uh, uh, detection of uh, freezing rain events, and they found that uh, a number of events, uh, kind of like, more like freezing drizzle, uh, that minus four worked better. But you ended up with a lot of big snow events, especially events uh, along the I-95 corridor where you're, uh, you have a deep layer that's just barely cold enough to snow. Uh, and we were getting get lots of output of freezing rain and sleet in pretty clear-cut snow events. So I uh, did, some, did some work revising the NSEP algorithm to uh, make the area check uh, based on warm area instead of cold area. And what we found is that that scheme did successfully produce a lot more snow, but it actually flipped things too far. We never implemented it, but just our tests showed that it predicted too much snow. Well, there had been a lot of buzz at that time uh, about the uh, Raymer scheme, so we uh, started testing that one as well. We started uh, generating uh, these uh, the mediograms in, in test mode where um, we would uh, try out what the different precip types look like. And this is, a, a, again, Philadelphia case with temperature and dew point here and some of the uh, different uh, uh, levels, 900 up down to 700, their uh, temperature or profile. And then here we have, again, the standard NCEP algorithm, the revised, and then the RAMER. It's kind of like a little bit of a bake-off here. And you see here uh, an event, uh, and I'll fill in the verification on the bottom. This is a, a heavy snow event uh, in Philadelphia. And the uh, NCEP algorithm predicted a long period of freezing rain. The revised algorithm had snow. The uh, RAMER also had uh, snow. And this green line here in the represents the field I'll talk about a, a little bit more. It's the uh, percent of frozen precip, which is a, a great way to uh, uh, distinguish something directly out of the microphysics uh, in, at that point, the ADA, now the NAM, uh, which in this case is uh, 100%. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But basically, we decided to go operational with going away from that single algorithm to what we call the dominant precip type, which creates a, a mini ensemble within the post-processor of precip type outco uh, outcomes. We used that standard NCEP algorithm, the revised, and the RAMER, and we added in the uh, Bourgeois uh, as well. For the NAM, we add in a, a fifth uh, member of that little uh, ensemble. Uh, it's called the explicit method. Uh, it's not available for the GFS. The microphysics uh, don't uh, have enough output to, for that. But you first use the percent of frozen precip to make a distinction uh, between uh, rain and freezing rain versus snow and ice pellets. If it's percent of frozen precip is less than 50, uh, we use the skin temperature to make a determination between rain and freezing rain. If it's greater than 50, then we use the rhyme factor that Brad mentioned a couple talks uh, back. Uh, if it's uh, greater than 10, we say it's ice pellets, and if it's less uh, than 10, we go with snow. So you get five answers for precip type, and we pick what we call the dominant one. Uh, we, we see uh, which uh, occurs the most, and we break ties favoring what we call the most dangerous weather. We want to favor freezing rain as giving the uh, highest uh, uh, winds and the uh, rain getting the lowest. Again, though, uh, you know, these, these, uh, what this little ensemble is is just taking a single uh, temperature profile and the uncertainty within the actual uh, suite of algorithms much less than the uncertainty you get on the synoptic scale, i.e., this does not account for uh, if the model uh, forecast of the temperature profile or wet bulb temperature profile is way off, this does not uh, account for that. So we actually have a, a, a website where you can you know, see the different uh, algorithm or the, the output from the different algorithms that go into dominant type. We, we output it in gridded data just the dominant type but for every buffer uh, location, we have a mediogram where you can see all of the uh, five different uh, algorithms that go into the dominant type. And uh, again, that uh, website uh, is listed down there on the bottom. But uh, for all these stations, again, we, we plot the dominant type, 
than the five types that go into it, NSEP, Raymer, the explicit, the bourgeois, and the revised NSEP. And you can see the uh, percent of frozen precip here in this uh, solid line to, uh, to get a feel for that uh, as well. And it's a, a nice way to get a sense of whether the dominant type is a, a clear-cut win for one type or is uh, somewhat of a, a, a mixed bag. Uh, just with this method, again, it's now in the GFS, in the SREF, and the high-res windows. We, uh, we learned the lesson the hard way when we added this method to the uh, GFS. Uh, after one upgrade, uh, in 2008 or 9 or so, all of a sudden in the spring, we started seeing very large coverage of sleet across most of Canada. Well, our algorithms do a search for, from the lowest level up to the highest level in the model when searching for a warm layer, to uh, potentially melt a, uh, a raindrop. And what happened is this GFS upgrade moved the model top to 10 millibars, and we basically ended up uh, sampling stratospheric warming, such that the algorithms were basically seeing this melting layer at 15 millibars and saying, aha, we've got sleet. So we, uh, we, le we learned the hard way that a, a simple uh, one to uh, last model level uh, uh, check didn't work and we uh, capped the uh, check up at uh, 250 millibars. Uh, a big difference between the uh, uh, NAM and GFS, not just that the GFS doesn't have the explicit method as, as part of its uh, algorithm, but uh, a big thing is that the GFS, uh, the, the NAM looks at the instantaneous precip rate and only puts out a, a precip type there. The GFS puts out an instantaneous precip type at any point that's had precip in the last several hours. So you'll see a lot more coverage in uh, the GFS uh, compared to the NAM. The, uh, the SHREF, uh, real quick, uh, it also uses the dominant precip type for all members. So you get 26 uh, precip types and uh, computes probability and, and means based on that, that, that same order of a comparison. You get a mean, and then you get probabilities of uh, each of the individual types. Just a little bit of danger with SREF probs. You can't necessarily combine probabilities for QPF with probabilities for precip type. For example, a 50% probability of freezing rain in a situation where you also have a 50% probability of precip exceeding a half inch does not mean a 50% probability of a half inch of freezing rain. In theory, you could have 13 members with just a little bit of freezing rain and 13 members with up near an inch, and you would get that uh, outcome uh, there with the 50-50. Uh, so you need to look at individual members. Again, you can't combine probabilities of a particular type with probabilities of QPF thresholds. Uh, quickly, the, uh, this is a, a D.C. area busted storm in uh, 2013 where uh, we had predictions for heavy amounts in the local area. Uh, all the shrek plumes were going very heavy here. And uh, just shows the uh, percent of frozen precip uh, gave a signal uh, in this event that we, we, we learned that we needed to look at this more after the event. Here, basically, the, uh, precip, the uh, dominant precip type was showing snow in the local area. We ended up with kind of a white rain event that didn't accumulate. And the... Uh, uh, percent of frozen precip values were noticeably lower uh, than the uh, top end of the spectrum uh, in, in the NAM, suggesting that there were hints in the model that while that, uh, the profile may have, may have uh, uh, allowed for snow, it really wasn't it was going to be a very wet snow that was going to struggle to uh, accumulate. Uh, I want to finish with the, uh, the wrap and the hur, which are, are treated a little bit differently. They don't use precip type uh, algorithms. Uh, they determine precip type uh, based on the uh, explicit prediction of uh, various hydrometeors, rain, snow, uh, and grapple that reach the surface. These are uh, from the uh, uh, Thompson bulk microphysics. And one big difference is where the dominant type gives you a, uh, a one for one of the four types, you can get yes answers for multiple precip types out of the wrap uh, and the her. And this uh, really simple uh, uh, decision uh, tree here that's uh, shown, uh, courtesy of uh, Stan and, and, and Curtis, I'll uh, narrow it down here to it starts by computing a snow fraction, it's the, uh, which is the snow that uh, fell in the past hour divided by the uh, uh, total of snow and rain over the last hour. It determines the potential for snow, rain, or freezing rain 
based on the fall rates for rain and snow, the amount of rain and snow in the previous hour, and the two-meter temperature. And then there's a separate branch over here for uh, that checks the fall rate for grapple to determine the uh, potential for ice uh, pellets. Again, also dependent on the fall rates for rain and snow, the uh, maximum rain mixing ratio, and the uh, two-meter temperature. And again, that what I know, what I said there, that maximum uh, rate or maximum uh, rain uh, mixing ratio. The check here is done on uh, 0.005 grams per kilogram. Right now, in the operational wrap, uh, there's an error where it's actually 0.05 is the check, which, as a result, you don't meet the criteria for sleet, and you see pretty much no sleet in the operational wrap uh, right now. That correction is coming uh, in the wrap V3, unfortunately, after this winter, uh, but it is already in the uh, operational HER. And just leave uh, end with a question going forward. Uh, Mark Klein of WPC raised this a little bit uh, in his presentation uh, the other day, uh, where he, he suggested that maybe the, uh, the precip type schemes are a little bit outdated. So the question is, well, now that we have more sophisticated microphysics and higher resolution, the question is, should we move the models towards using a precip type that's more uh, directly out of the microphysics, like the uh, RAP and the HER are doing, or at least in the models that have the dominant type, do we give higher weight to the uh, explicit algorithm that's more based out of the microphysics? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We have time for a couple of questions. Just a comment to help the discussion go on in the further. We do have a manuscript that is just accepted with minor revision for weather and forecasting on the explicit p-type. So we'll send that out to all of you guys so to be able to have something to look at about that aspect. Thanks for your help on that, Jeff. More of a for help than a question. Um, from my observation, the sophistication of how you're generating precipitation types now in NWP of all kinds is light years ahead of our ability at a WFO to actually generate precip type with our tool sets. There's a huge disconnect. Um, I'd be surprised if I'm the only one that thinks that, but um, it's possible. Uh, but I, I just think that it, it's got to be a priority going forward that we somehow connect what, how we do this in the field with, with because it, it, it's just, I just feel like we're helpless to actually harness a lot of these tools in our day-to-day -day operations. And I know we're trying to work this problem in the national blend, but do many of you know how we're generating precip type in the field? I mean, I think you might be horrified if you actually sat down with us and did it. And I, I mean, Steve Zubrick's on the line, so maybe he can elaborate. Short answer, Jeff, I, I don't think we have a good feel for uh, for what you do, and, and we'd like to know more. Time for one last question. Matt Perutka from MDL, and a, a, an echo for what Jeff said, because, of course, we're statistically post-processing all this. and. We need to be far better connected and understand what's coming out and when it's changing and how it's changing so that we can be that step that, that runs in between. So. Yeah, phone numbers. Well, I'm oh, um, Jeff. Just to add one other aspect, between this is Brett Barrier. 
between the GS and the NAM, and this applies to all the models, the area of P-type is also very sensitive to the lowest precipitation rate threshold. You have absolutely no threshold. Most of Canada lights up with lots of very, very, very light snow during the winter. That is true, too. I know there was an attempt in the GFS to change it to do just do instantaneous, but they couldn't get that in the last upgrade uh, in, in time. All right. Thank you, Jeff. That wraps up this session. Let's, uh, let's have one last round of applause for all the speakers this session.